If you have a Bible with you, I invite, invite you to join me in um, the Old Testament book of Exodus. In a moment, we're going to be in, in chapter 32. But uh, real quick, this is the first Sunday of the month, and um, as is our tradition, we uh, take communion on the first Sunday of every month. And so if you are at home, I encourage you to take an opportunity now to uh, grab a couple of the elements so you can uh, participate with us at home um, at the end of the sermon. And uh, for you gathering here, uh, we are going back to kind of a, a pre-COVID way of doing communion with the actual physical bread and a cup. Uh, we also do have the pre-packaged ones, uh, and I'll give some instructions at the end of the service, but um, we, I invite, I'll invite you to come forward to receive communion. And you can either choose the bread uh, dipped in the juice or uh, the individualized cup. So, uh, but that will, that will be at the end of the service this morning. Well, as Pastor Jake pointed out, we, we are in the season of Lent. And to observe this time leading up to Easter, we're, we're going through the wilderness experience of God's people in the book of Exodus. And we're taking a look at all these major crisis moments between God and his people, and we're correlating that with a New Testament gospel story. And so last week, Jake preached this message on um, the, the Exodus uh, moment where the uh, the God's people face their first battle, and, and Moses has to kind of stand on this hilltop with his hands raised, and he needs Moses and her to come support his arms to keep them raised all day. And he correlated that with the New Testament gospel story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying, facing temptation, needing the support of his disciples. This morning, the next crisis moment that we're going to be looking at in Exodus comes from Exodus chapter 32, and I'm going to be reading the first 14 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, and the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf, and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, and with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all of this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring." And they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have this distinct memory from elementary school uh, during P.E. That, we, that the P.E. coach would, would always give roll call at the beginning of P.E. and we, We'd be sitting in the gymnasium and he'd go through the, the list of names on his roll call. And, and when someone wasn't there in the room, but who was kind of on campus, uh, this is what would inevitably happen is he would call that person's name and someone in the class would shout out, here but not here, indicating that they were, they were here at school, right? They were here somewhere on the campus, but they weren't there in the gymnasium. And I'm not sure if that was a practice that other schools did and other kids did across the country, or we were just kind of some odd ducks. Who were, but every time someone was there but not actually in the room, someone would always say, here but not here, indicating this simultaneous presence and absence of the student. I was thinking about that this week because this is a paradox that Christians are familiar with, this idea of, of simultaneous presence and absence, here but not here. Right? We, 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 we look at this during the season of Advent. Right? We, we celebrate that, that Jesus, that God came to earth to be with us, that he is here with us, and at the same time, we're waiting for him to return. He's here but not Quite fully here yet. We celebrate that, that, that Jesus came to proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the kingdom of heaven is among us. It is here, but at the same time, we're waiting for it to be here in its fullness. It's here, but it's not here. You might have experienced this in just your own personal walk with God, that you, you know that God is with you, but sometimes you feel like he's not. And there's this tension of simultaneous presence, that God is present with you, but also absent. It's a tension that we live with as, as, with, as Christians. A paradox, if you will. And this is a tension that that the Israelites were experiencing in Exodus 32, that, that they knew that God was there. They had seen his works. They saw him in a, in a cloud of, of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. They, they heard his voice speaking to them. They, they saw him moving. They knew he was there. And at the same time, we see that they, they, they felt his absence. You know, we, we have this big gap from last Sunday to this Sunday. Last Sunday, Pastor Jake was in chapter 17, and, and this week we're all the way back towards the end of Exodus in chapter 32. And much, much of what happens in between 17 and 32 is Moses going up to the mountain and speaking to God and receiving instructions from God so that he can then give it to the people. And so here, Moses is on top of Mount Sinai, and he's been up there for a while now, receiving the commandments, receiving all these rules, re receiving uh, instructions on how to build the tabernacle and what, what worship is going to look like for the people of God, and, and all these different plans of how God is shaping these Israelite people who were not a people into a people, how he's shaping this group who is not a nation and making them into a nation, and he, he's going into all these details on the Mount Sinai with Moses. But it's taking some time, and, and the people are getting impatient. So yet yeah, we, we know God is, is here, but we feel his absence, and so they go to Aaron and make this request. out of impatience. I have three lessons or, or points that I want to, to draw our attention to this morning, and, and this one is the first one. The first lesson we can learn from 
the story of Exodus 32. And it's, it's simply this. When you experience the tension between Yahweh's presence and his absence, practice patient trust. When you experience this, sometimes this painful tension, this, this presence and absence simultaneously, practice patient trust. And here we see the people of Israel not practicing patient trust. They're in a hurry. They get impatient. They don't know what has happened to this Moses that led them out of the the land of Egypt. And so they go to Aaron and say, make for us a God. Give us something to look at. Give us something to touch. Give us something to worship. Give us the presence that we need because they're feeling the void of Yahweh's absence. Jesus felt this tension as well. The New Testament passage that I have for us to to look at this morning in correlation with Exodus 32 is is Matthew chapter 4. And in this text, Jesus The only faithful Israelite is in the wilderness. Not for 40 years, but he's there for 40 days, preparing to enter into his public ministry. And when he's in the wilderness, he gets, if you know the story, he gets tempted by the devil. And and we're told of three temptations that, that the devil brings to Jesus. And this morning, we're going to be looking at just the third one. And in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 8, it says this, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. I imagine that when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, he he must have felt this distinct presence and absence from his heavenly Father. Right? He, he knew he was, that the God was with him, that, that he is God, that him and the Father are one. But at the same time, he was in the wilderness. He was isolated. He was alone. And the company that he had for 40 days was the devil tempting him. He was living for 40 days, fasting in this tension of God's presence and absence. But unlike the Israelites, Jesus practiced patient trust. The temptation came to Jesus, and the temptation was to, in a way, to kind of just cut to the chase and get to the end of the story. Jesus knew that he was the Messiah. He knew he was sent to save the people of Israel, to rescue them out of their bondage, out of their slavery, out of their sin, out of their death. He knew He was there to save them. And the devil offers him a way to do it just like that. He offers them this temptation that he doesn't have to wait for God's plan. God's plan is slow. God's plan can be painful. It can involve even suffering and betrayal and death. And right there in this moment, Jesus has an opportunity to bypass all of that, to inherit all the kingdoms of the world, and do whatever he wants with them. But he chooses patient trust because that is not the will of his Father. But he answered, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Let 
when the people came to Aaron and out of their impatience requesting a God to worship, Moses told them to bring him their gold. The Israelites, they had a lot of baggage when they came out of Egypt. Physical baggage, things they took with them, but, but also some emotional baggage, some spiritual baggage, some things that were kind of weighing them down spiritually and emotionally and mentally and even physically. And gold is one of these items. Right back during the, the Exodus, we didn't go into it in this series, but the story of the Exodus, when God delivers his people out of Egypt, the night before he brings them out of Egypt, he tells them to go to his Egyptian, their Egyptian neighbors and request their silver and gold. And it said God, that God gave them favor in sight of the Egyptians, and when they asked for their silver and gold, the Egyptians just gave it to them. Probably maybe out of fear because all the plagues that had just happened. Maybe they were realizing who this Yahweh really is. And so they gave the Israelites all of their gold and sent them out of Egypt with all of their gold. For me, this gold is a metaphor. It's a metaphor that points to the reality that, that God wants to take the baggage of Israel's history and he wants to make something precious and beautiful and good out of it. He takes this gold of Egypt and he is making a plan with Moses to shape it into a way to worship God. This gold is going to be used in the tabernacle to make golden lampstands. It's going to be used in the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be used all throughout the tabernacle. It's going to be used as a way to worship Yahweh, to help shape the people to be his people. And this is the second lesson that I want us to learn from this text, is that God wants to take the baggage of your past, and he wants to use it to make something good and beautiful and precious. That's God's plan here for the Israelites. It's, God, it's God's plan for your life as well. Time and time again, God points back to Israel's history, the pain of their history, to show them how to do something good with it. That's why so often we see God stressing the Sabbath. He reminds his people for 400 years, you were slaves in Egypt. You did not get a day off. You worked Every day, every day of your life for 400 years, you are my people. Now you shall take a Sabbath. You will take a day of rest. Remember that you worked hard without rest. Be my people, and on the seventh day you will rest because that is holy unto the Lord. He tells his people, remember, you were slaves. And so we have all these rules about, about not enslaving your neighbor, not enslaving your brother and sister. He reminds his people, you were in great debt, and that's why you were slaves in Egypt. And so forgive each other's debts. We have this year of jubilee that every seven years that, that people are going to forgive the debts that are owed to them so that slavery will not be a reality in Israel. He tells his people, remember the bad. He, notice that he doesn't tell them, okay, you're out of Egypt now, so forget the past. Don't worry about it anymore. Just kind of Put it under the rug and move on. Now you're my people, so just don't, don't even think about that anymore. No, time and time again, he tells his people to remember Egypt. Remember you were slaves. Remember you were abused. Remember you were taken advantage of. Remember your children were murdered. Remember all of these horrible things that happened. And put them into my hands and let me make something 
good out of it. But this is slow work, isn't it? This is difficult work. And when it takes too long and when it gets too hard, the temptation is to take hold of the past ourselves and to shape it ourselves. This is the temptation that the Israelites faced. This Moses is taking too long. This process is it's too difficult. It's too, it's too uncertain. Be, being shaped into the people of God is, is too uncertain. Even knowing who Yahweh is is uncertain. Can you imagine being in the wilderness? I mean, for, for 400 years, they had no idea really anything about Yahweh. All of a sudden, he shows up. He, he performs these plagues. We, we have you know, God present with them, but he's always clouded in this, this cloud of darkness. We can't see him, we can't touch him, but, but we can hear him, right? We can hear his voice, and it's terrifying. His voice is like a thunderstorm and an earthquake, all at the same time, just, just rattling our souls, and to such an extent that the people say, we can't stand to be in his presence, so Moses, you go and talk to him on our behalf, because his voice is so terrifying, we can't stand it. This Yahweh, this one who says that he is, is a mystery. And it produces this anxiety in the Israelites. This whole process is uncertain and difficult, and it takes a long time. And so out of a place of uncertainty and impatience, they take the gold from their baggage and Aaron shapes it into something familiar. He shapes it into something safe. A golden calf. In Egypt, they were familiar with worshiping these types of gods. Right? These types of gods that you could look at, that you could go to, and you could see, and you could touch, and you could pray to, and they didn't answer their voice wasn't terrifying because you couldn't hear it. This was a God that was tame, a God that was controllable. And this is what this is the type of God that they desired. During the time of Jesus in the first century. God's people were still carrying this baggage. Once again, they found themselves oppressed, taken advantage of, being murdered, desiring freedom and independence, waiting for the Messiah to deliver them. And here Jesus is in the wilderness and the devil offers him this temptation, this way to rescue all the people. He shows them all, all the, the nations, all the kingdoms of this world, and all of their glory and all of their gold. And he says, you can have it all. You can be the king and conqueror of, of the whole world, of every nation. You can be Caesar and kings and everything, all wrapped up in once. You can be all three branches of the, of the government, all wrapped up in once. You can do whatever you want. If you want to free a people, all you got to do is say a word, and the people are free. If you want to enslave a people, just say the word, and they're enslaved. If you want to free the Jews, take this deal, and you can do it right now. And certainly, this is the type of Messiah that we find that the people wanted. But this is not the type of Messiah that God sent. He was tempted to take all the gold of those nations and shape it himself. And instead, he, he, 
he decided to put his patient trust in the Lord and allow God to shape the burden of this past and to turn it into something good and beautiful and precious. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. when we fail to patiently trust God, when, when we use our own hands to shape our past in order to give us stability and, and certainty in the present and the future, then we end up making false gods and calling it Yahweh. We end up making false gods, but we call it Yahweh anyway. And this is the, the third lesson I want to, us to, to take from this chapter. is simply to resist this temptation. To make golden calves and call it Yahweh. The text tells us that, that they made the, the, Aaron made this golden calf and they announced, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw this, he built, an air, he built an altar before it, and he said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. They made a golden calf, and they called it Yahweh. And we can do this today. We still do this today. We do this in we find this in all different areas of life. We, we find this in, you know, as, as Christians are in the business world seeking success in business and, and enterprise and, and just success in life. And, and we find these definitions of sex, success in, in business as, as usually having a lot of money. You're successful. Even Christians have this mentality. You are successful when you have a lot of money, when you have a lot of power, when you have more influence, when you have more control. Even in churches, like you, are, you are successful as a church when you have a lot of people, when you have a lot of money, when you have a lot of buildings, when you have a lot of power, when you have a lot of influence. Does this sound like the success of Jesus? Whenever we define success in those terms, we are shaping a golden calf and we are calling it Yahweh. We do this in politics. Anytime we can't separate our identity as a disciple of Jesus and citizen of and the kingdom of heaven, and we can't separate that from our political party. And those became, become one and the same. We are shaping a golden calf and we are calling it Yahweh. We see this raise its head in Christian nationalism. We see this in, in ideas of, of, of that God wants you to be rich and never have any health problems. And you will be rich and have no health problems if you just send me a certain amount of money and, and then everything will be fine with you. Whenever we adopt that kind of prosperity gospel, we are shaping a golden calf and we're saying, let's bow down and worship Yahweh. We can even see this in the particular ways that we worship. That, that if we claim, oh, we, we have to worship a certain way. We have to sing certain songs and not other songs. We have to preach in a certain style and not the other styles. We, we can only do the sacraments in a certain way and not these other ways. And we're doing it right and they're doing it wrong. We shape these golden calves and we bow down before it in worship and we call it Yahweh. The calf represents Yahweh on our terms. The people of Israel wanted to worship Yahweh, but they wanted to worship him on their terms. But over and over again, he makes it clear that he will only be received and worshiped on his terms. 
And Jesus models for us perfectly how to accept the Father on his terms and not our own. He demonstrates this in the wilderness. He demonstrates this in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he demonstrates this on the cross. In each of these instances, Jesus is faced with a temptation to take things into his own hands. But listen to his words at each of these moments. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Not my will, but yours be done. And to your hands I commit my spirit. These are words of surrender. These are words of patient trust, knowing that his heavenly Father knows best, that his plan is best, and he will submit to it, and he will show us how to submit to that plan with our lives. So as we follow Jesus, may we be a people, may we be a community who can claim that there are no golden calves here. That the only gold that we have is the gold that we have brought from our past that is heavy and burdensome. But we are placing it into the hands of God, and he is making something good and beautiful and precious out of it. Something that will be used for his glory, something that will be used for our worship, for our service to him.